nanohub.org. You can follow along with this presentation using printed slides from the NanoHub. Visit www.nanohub.org and download the PDF file containing the slides for this presentation. Print them out and turn each page when you hear the following sound. Enjoy the show. So this is lecture 24 on large signal response of PN junction diode. Now if you remember that uh, we are using the PN junction diode as a prototype of a very simple device. You know, the, you can, only simpler thing would be a homogeneous chunk of semiconductor and which is basically a register and we know how to calculate resistance and other things. And this is the simplest one because you have a N type doping and a P type doping, just two pieces, a junction. And we are going through this exercise of think, finding out how this device responds. So in equilibrium, we draw the band diagram, solve the Poisson equation and how, saw how the built-in potential and how the depletion width and all those things, how, how they come about. Uh, we have talked about DC. Uh, the DC was a lot of discussion, right? Because when you apply a bias, we found that although the current is asymmetric, positive bias, it has a type of current which is exponentially rising with voltage. On the negative bias, it was saturating but there were lots of very interesting regimes. One was this trap assisted or defect assisted low voltage regime, diffusion limited regime, ambipolar. And similarly on the reverse bias side, we talked about Zener tunneling and uh, avalanche breakdown, right? So all pieces are very interesting. And if you understand them, this forms almost a comprehensive list. Uh, in the last class, we talked about small signal response that beyond the DC, if you, in addition, catch a signal from air, let's say you are listening to a radio station and then you have a diode, then you have a DC voltage, which is your battery, you know, your AAA or AA battery, but in addition, you pick up this microvolt amount of signal from the air. And how would the circuit or the diode in equivalence re respond to that small voltage that we found, right? We found that there are diffusion capacitance for minority carriers, Majority carriers, there was junction capacitance, and of course the conductance that depends on the, the bias point. Today we'll be talking about this large signal response. This is more like digital signals, that you have, let's say, one volt, and instantaneously you turn it to minus two volts, let's say, logic level one to zero. Or go the other way around. Go from minus two volts, let's say, to plus one volt. And if you make this transition too fast, then what you have learned before wouldn't apply exactly. And that is what would be the discussion, topic of discussion today. So I'll start with a, a charge control model and I'll explain how that comes about. Uh, we'll start by talking about the turn off characteristics, which is going from logic level one to logic level zero. Now remember, logic level zero doesn't mean voltage zero. Logic level zero might mean voltage of minus two volts, for example. This is just two separate, largely separated voltages. And we'll talk about a little bit turn on characteristics and uh, then uh, we'll conclude. Consider a diode in a circuit. And the voltage source, instead of being a AAA battery, is actually transitioning between two voltage levels. Voltage level one, maybe a volt, and voltage level zero, which may be minus two volts, let's say. Any, any voltage, any specific voltage. Now the diode is in series, you are measuring the current. And if you just think about the diode itself, you will get this IV characteristics, right? It is biased at a certain point, And you can see the P side of the device is connected when it's logic one, connected to the P side, N to N side. And so it's forward biased. And so you can see the blue dot on the IV characteristics indicating that there is a finite amount of current flowing if it is at logic level zero through the diode. Now, if you gradually turned it off, you know, over a period of seconds, then what would have happened that at every instant, the diode would have adjusted to the DC potential almost, and it would have gradually followed this curve. It is that the last point is, let's say, minus two volts, Every point is sort of in quasi-equilibrium. It knows the IV characteristics. So beyond the DC calculation that we already did, if the transition is slow, 
then we don't really need anything more. Although the transition is not DC, it is almost DC at every point. However, if you make the transition very fast, let's say in your computer, these days this thing runs as tens of gigahertz in a nanosecond. If you change it that fast, then all of a sudden you'll see that it cannot really follow this path. What it is going to do is follow that red dotted path. That instantaneously it will flip the current and flip the current you can see that immediately going keeping the voltage the same. Why the voltage remains the same? I'll explain in a second. But what it's going to do from the positive current you see well, y axis is positive it immediately will flip the uh, flip the direction of the current as the voltage source wants the current to go the other direction. It immediately responds to that dictate that current should go the other direction. But then you can see for a while the current remains almost the same as the voltage is decaying off from a positive voltage gradually going to zero. And then for a little bit it has the final final descent to the final final equilibrium point. Of course the final equilibrium point has to be the same because that's the final state. What I'd like to explain to you today is the physics of this. That why it takes this particular path under what conditions and how to understand that. That's the purpose of this lecture. Now if you want to look it at it in a slightly different way you could plot the voltage and the current as a function of time. You see this is voltage versus time on the right hand plot with time as a parameter. So every point here you could stamp a time. But in addition you could split it up also. You could plot the voltage as a function of time and current as a function of time. Do you see that the, uh, the right hand side and the top graphs essentially contains the same information? Let me explain. Look at the, the, the yellow points. The yellow points are the voltages before this transition occurred. I had a forward bias. You can see on the left hand side the voltage versus time curve. I have also a forward bias positive current and that's called I sub F, you know, F for forward. Now, if you switch it very quickly again, then you can see you will have this green circle. The green circle is the current that has dropped down. And you can immediately see also in the current versus time plot that the current has switched from IF to IR and it has done so instantaneously. There's no time in there, right? So you can see almost instantaneously. But for the voltage, look at it. The voltage, the green circle is sitting on top of the yellow square. So voltage has not changed. Now that's strange. Voltage is the same, current going the opposite direction. I mean, how can that happen? So we'll see that. And then finally, you see that ray triangle. Ray triangle is when the voltage has gradually decayed to its final value, essentially going to voltage equals zero. And on the left hand top side, you can see the triangle. And similarly, but for the current, look at this. Going from the green circle to the red arrow or red triangle, the current has more or less remains the same. Now that's very strange and we like to explain that. Now let me explain some terminology so that I can help you guide through these concepts. By the way, when you do 0 to 1, minus 2 volts to plus 1 volt, again it is going to take a non-trivial path. It is not going to follow the steady state DC characteristics and that's shown here in blue dotted line. Now a few quick definitions. The definition uh, is the, we'll call this time T sub S, storage time, is the time when the current essentially remains the same. During its transition, current remains essentially the same. We'll call that T sub S. And for many circuits, many minority carrier circuits, I mean, sorry, minority carrier devices like a PN junction diode, this time is the dominant time. This is the storage time and I'll explain why they call it storage. But it is only typically true for that minority carrier type devices that this time would be long and dominant. Then there is this TR. The TR time is when the voltage has gone to zero and it's gradually swinging back 
to the equilibrium reverse bias point, you know, gradually going down. That's the T sub R. Now, T sub R for this device will not be as big, but for many devices, as we'll show, short key barrier diode, majority carrier diode, in that case, that's the next class, TR might become the dominant one. And the total time is TRR, which is called the reverse recovery time. This is the time it takes for the signal to go voltage to go from positive side to the negative side. Now, why, do I, what, why am I interested in this time? Because if you try to flip the current or flip the voltage faster than this time, your circuit isn't going to work. So you calculate this time and design your circuit slower than this so that the voltage can reach the final point without any trouble. Okay, now I have to solve this equation. Now that's going to be a challenge. You can see Poisson equation, I have to solve it from minus plus 1 to minus 2 volts. Now that's not something that's very good. This time I cannot say n is n naught e to the power j omega t. It is not the signal coming from your 920 am uh, radio signal with a micro volt from the air. This is going from 1 to minus 1 volt or minus 1 to plus 1 to minus 2 volts. I cannot drop dn dt. Well, I cannot really do much with this. So I will have to stay with this and solve this. It turns out that indeed on the computer you can do that. People do that often. But I can simplify this and that will in fact give me a lot of information. A simplification of this where I get rid of the space coordinate of this equation. And I will explain to you how. The way if we can get rid of that, then I will have, instead of those two complicated equations, I will have this very simple first order differential equation. And similarly, instead of this whole transport equation, drift and diffusion and all those things, I will have this very simple equation. You know, it's approximate, but for the transient, what are we going to do? If I had to solve this partial differential equation, back of the envelope, your, real, your envelope has to be pretty, pretty large in order to contain all this calculation. So these approximations are called charge control equations. It is an approximation when you have large signal time transient, you, you do. So I will explain to you how this comes about. But let's first talk about uh, the, what is happening in the device and how does this current flip without voltage flipping? How does it do that? So you see, let me assume that I have forward bias this diode. Do you see why it is forward biased? You can see the Fermi levels, quasi Fermi levels has been split by that amount. And uh, quasi Fermi level on the end side, assuming the right hand side is rounded, the left hand side has been pushed up, forward bias, minority carriers have been injected. Now in this particular case, I have assumed that there is recombination on the minority carrier side. How do you know that? Because this curve in xt is actually exponentially dying off. Had there been no traps, then it should have been a straight line going across. Okay, but then what happens? Now if I all on a sudden go from VDC from the DC voltage to a reverse bias voltage, right? So the Fermi level on the left hand side will go down significantly, immediately. In that case, this is what's going to happen. The current will go down a little bit and then the charge will gradually, it's, the charge is gradually disappearing. Where is the charge going? The charge is going to the other side, getting back where it came from. And part of it is recombining with the traps and with the majority carriers. So you had a big buildup of charge and gradually this charge is going away and eventually this charge will all be gone and you will get to the reverse side. But one thing I want you to see, do you see what is happening in here? Although initially the total amount of charge was exactly the same, right? When I turned it off, look at the slope on the left hand side. The slope, I have changed the slope, although I have not changed the charge more or less, but since I have changed the slope at that point, going now the current will be going in the negative direction. So it follows the dictate that the current must be going in the negative direction simply by just nodding its head a little bit in that direction, in the opposite direction, because dn dx, 
diffusion coefficient multiplied by dn dx is the current. So all I care about is not the n, n could be anything. So long I allow the dn dx in the right direction, current will be flowing in that direction. So you can see that by keeping this profile, my current will all be going, it will be a constant and going in the negative direction, although the charge may be huge and actually be corresponding to a forward bias charge. Okay, so this is a plot I will be showing you often. The idea is you should see that this is a time sequence of the charge that is sitting inside the PN junction, uh, inside the minority carrier as you are going from the forward bias to the reverse bias. Now, this is the equation, transient equation. I want to derive that uh, charge control equation. I will explain how. First of all, it's minority carrier, right? So I should always be able to take out the electric field. As I said, taking that out is a little subtle. And I have explained to you, you should learn it once so that later on when you drop it off, you sort of know that you can go back and explain to a student. But for the time being, minority carrier side, majority carrier holds the potential, I drop the electric field. So I have the diffusion term. Now on the diffusion term, I have this N0, which is equilibrium density. Well, N0 does not depend on time. I get that rid of that. And I have delta N, which is whatever the charge. You see on the top right hand side, the charge profile, this delta N is a function of X and is a function of time. You can see that the top side, it has changes with space and also changing with time. Do you see why there should be a second derivative with respect to the diffusion coefficient? Of course, because you insert the expression for J sub n and that's what you have. And if this is essentially a small injection condition, then isn't the shockley reed hall term becomes delta n over tau sub n, right? When you have put a small amount of charge in. So that's what you have, delta n divided by tau sub n, that's the shockley reed hall condition. It's a partial differential equation, still not probably easy to solve. But let's see whether we can do some more. This we could do. Let's say we take that delta n multiplied by q and a and delta x and then integrate from 0 to wp. 0 to wp, what is that? That's the minority carrier region on the p side, right? And so that I'm just integrating the whole thing. Now, if I integrate, now that whole quantity Q A delta N, well, that's changing with time, right? Do you remember? It was a big initial triangle and it was gradually going down. So, of course, that's changing with time. Let me call that thing, whatever is inside, area under this curve, Q. Q is changing with time, of course, but I have integrated over WP. And the WP is from 0 to WP's end of this region. So that will be my area under the curve. And so therefore, I could write, do you see whether I could write this? Q is the whole thing. And D DT, for that will give me the first term, DQ DT. That's no problem. Now what about the second term, the diffusion term? Do you agree how I have written the second term in this particular way? Look at this. The second term was a second derivative with respect to x. So those, uh, the second derivative I have written as dx and dx. And then I have cross multiplied with dx. That will take care of 1 dx. So I have a differential of q a delta n, right? And if I have a differential, can I not integrate it out? If it's a differential, I, I can always take that differential and integrate it out. And that you will see that says that I have the first term is the current that is going out from the right hand side. And the second term with respect to diffusion coefficient, which is current coming into, the, into this box. That's the first and second time. And the last term, well, that's the recombination term. Qn divided by tau sub n. Now you have seen this type of integration before. Where have you seen this? Do you remember the delta function business? The second derivative, anytime in the Schrodinger equation, when I gave you a delta function, you had to integrate it across a delta function. 
and the two sides you had this first derivative on one side and the first derivative on the other side that was separated by the discontinuity. Well, the same trick here. I haven't done anything else. You just multiply dx and integrate it out. Okay, there is a typo. I can see that wn should be wp on the, the top side. Okay, but you, you get the idea. So the current, so what does this equation say? Well, this equation is telling me, this equation is telling me that the charge that is building up in this box is equal to the current that's coming in from the left hand side, do you see? x equals 0, that's the current that's coming in and the current that's getting out, x equals wp. And so the total amount of charge that is building in is the equal to the net amount of electron that is flowing in. That's why it's called charge control. And of course, a certain amount of charge is going away through recombination. Do you see that Q divided by tau n term? That is the amount of charge that is getting out. So only thing I have done, and this is a general trick by the way, anytime you have a differential equation, Schrodinger equation, diffusion equation, any equation that you can have, second order partial differential equation, if you want a big signal transient, you can do, do this in any case, in any problem. It's nothing to do with this particular problem, but it's a general physics problem or general mathematical trick. Okay, so I have a beautiful simple equation. Now I may be able to solve something. So let's look at the turn of characteristics. I'm making an equivalence. On the left hand side, I'm going from one to zero. And to reflect that similar situation in a, you know, undergraduate circuit type context, look at this right hand plot, right hand top plot. I initially have the PN junction forward biased with the voltage V sub F. And you look at the position of the switch. The switch is connected to the forward bias diode, right? Then once at time t equals zero, the switch goes from the forward bias uh, the battery and goes to immediately to the right hand side to kind of getting connected to the reverse bias battery. Do you see why it's called reverse bias? Because look at the negative terminal of the battery that is connected to the positive of the uh, positive of the diode. So it's reverse bias. So if I can understand this circuit, right hand top circuit, then actually I have understood the left hand circuit. And that's what we are going to do. So let's take a look. I have to solve this equation in that, in that top equation or top figure context, a top right context and see, try to calculate the storage time. The red T sub S is what I am after. T sub R will be a little complicated, so we'll not get there. For this device, T sub S is what we are after. Now at T less than zero, of course, the equation is given by this. Now do you see whether you agree? DQ dt, that's fine. I f, I sub f, well there is a forward current flowing, DC forward current flowing. So my I diffusion is I f, and that was not dependent on time, it was a DC thing. So that's what I have. Now what was this dq dt? It was steady state. Was there any change in with respect to time? Of course not. Right? There was a constant profile sitting there. So dq dt would be zero. Before I have started switching, there is no change in, change in charge. And so the dq dt is zero. Now the question is that why would the current remain the same after the transition also. That's, that's what I'm going to explain to you a little bit later. Now one thing I'm going to, uh, let, let me, before I go there, one thing is this current is going to remain the same. Do you remember in the last class when we were talking about this small signal response? We had a register, a diffusion capacitor, and a junction capacitor. Now can you change the voltage across a capacitor? instantaneously. You cannot, right? That will require because it's half CV squared. If you change V instantaneously, then that will require infinite amount of energy. So you cannot change the voltage instantaneously across the capacitor. And so, and thereby, since you cannot change the capacitance, therefore, you, not sorry, 
cannot change the voltage therefore you cannot change the charge as well because q is c multiplied by v c is a constant v you cannot change between 0 minus and 0 class and therefore q you cannot change also so from here can i write this that for t less than 0 dq dt is 0 steady state if is whatever current I was flowing in the forward bias case. I know the initial bias, 1 volt. I know the current. So I have that. And so Q at 0 minus, it is going to be IF multiplied by tau sub N, cross multiplied. DQ dt is 0. Okay. Now the charge cannot change, right? Because the voltage across the capacitor cannot change. Total integrated charge cannot change. So Q 0 minus is equal to Q0 plus. So that's fine. I'm trying to solve that equation during the transient period. So I'm setting up the boundary condition. You know, boundary condition anytime in the circuit, you have done this many times. So I shouldn't really uh, belabor this point. Okay, so how do I solve this equation then? Now at t greater than 0, t greater than 0, the current is uh, the equation is now dq dt equals minus ir. Now, why, why is minus ir? Because you see it's a reverse bias diode. The current must be flowing in the other direction. Whatever the vj is, whatever the junction voltage is, what is the maximum that it can be in the forward bias side? Equal to the band gap, right? It cannot be larger than the band gap because the VBI, the maximum voltage of VBI, the whole barrier it can be if you dope it on both sides degenerate. Then the maximum barrier it can be is equal to the band gap. So whatever you have, let's say you have a close to 0 0.6, 0 0.5, 0 0.6 volt. And then if VR is minus 2 volts, then you can just look at the circuit and immediately realize that given a R, the current in the output circuit must be flowing in the negative direction. It doesn't matter what the diode wants to do. Given that the diode can only have, let's say, 0.6 volts in plus, VR, let's say, is minus 2 volts, the output current in R must be negative, going in the negative direction. So the diode has no option but to supply the negative current. It, it doesn't want to change the voltage, fine. But it must supply the ne negative current, otherwise the circuit will not be satisfied. And it can do so easily. So by the way, uh, this current, and I, I'll show that this current, so long the Vj is smaller than, much smaller than Vr, that current through R will be simply Vr divided by R. Right? That's a small voltage, diode voltage. So in that case, the current is approximately a constant, not fully a constant, approximately. So Ir is a constant. And so this is a first order differential equation. Everybody can solve it, right? So you just cross multiply, divide, and then what will be the equation? What will be the answer from here, do you think? It's be some sort of log that will come out, and the time on the other side will have a certain amount of time uh, on, the, on the other side. Okay. And when you integrate, you will get an expression like this. You can see the log, right? And then you can see the two boundary conditions, q at 0 plus, that's on one end and q at t sub s, end of the storage time, that's the another end, right? Now this point is very important to understand and this is a conceptual thing that why IR can go in the opposite direction and I have explained that in a few minutes ago, while not changing the charge too much between 0 minus and 0 plus. You see all it has to do, all it has to do is can keep the charge almost the same but change the slope on the one end a little bit and that immediately gives it the requisite current minus IR and as it is losing the charge gradually over a period of time, it just keeps the slope exactly equal to the value that the circuit dictates. The circuit through the resistance R wants a fixed negative current and so it will just keep that profile Oh, I, okay, all right. So, how much time then? I have. I still haven't solved the problem completely, except 
if I make this assumption. You see, in the beginning, I had a lot of charge, forward bias diode. Uh, it was exponentially delta N, exponentially went with voltage, and it was gradually dying off. Millions of electrons sitting in the minority carrier storage. At the end, when the charges have all gone away, then it's a reverse bias diode. On one side, I have Ni squared divided by Na, and on another side, I have zero, because in the reverse bias side, the boundary condition requires that that's zero. And so I essentially have no charge left. You know, Ni squared over Na in silicon, let's say 10 to the power 18 dope. I have 100 minority carriers. And so one end I have 100, another end I have zero. I have minuscule amount of charge. In the beginning, I had millions of charges. As a result, I can get rid of this Q T sub S because that's the final amount of charge I'm left with. And if I do that, then I have an equation which is actually very simple. You see, IR plus IF, where did that IF come from? Do you remember Q at zero plus is equal to Q of zero minus? And Q of zero minus, I related to the forward bias current. So IR plus IF divided by IR. Now, there is something very interesting here. So do you realize that if you forward bias the device very hard, if you forward biased it very hard, then it will take a long time for the charge to go away because tau sub s is how long it the charge, how long it required for the charge to go away. And if I, uh, IF is very large, you forward biased it very hard, it will take more time. That makes sense, right? You can see that, that immediately makes sense. Tau sub n, when you have a lot of traps, is tau sub n large or small? Small, right? Tau sub n small. So when you have a lot of charge, it makes sense that charge will de decay very fast. It makes sense, right? As soon as, because this was a lot of area under this curve, and if you have a lot of traps, then it will go away very fast. If tau sub n is not very large, then it will require me a lot of time because all the electrons has to go out through the door, the other door, meaning the other side of the junction, Nothing is going out through the majority carrier side on the door acceptor side. And so it will take a lot of time. Now this is a very important point, tau sub n, because generally traps are bad. We don't want traps, right? Because it is non-ideal characteristics and all those things. But when we want ultra fast switching, many times people intentionally put in traps in the minority carrier side. Because by putting that in, you can see that you can turn on and off this diode very fast. And it will, I'll show you later that it behave, behaves almost like a majority carrier device at that time if you put a lot of tau sub n. And that's why this is a very important circuit trick that people put it by hand in order to analyze the devices. Okay. All right, what about the turn on characteristics or the uh, turn on voltage transient? Well, if you want to do the voltage, you can again start looking at the total charge Q sub n. Instead of integrating between 0 to T tau sub s, you know, that's what we did in the previous equation, you just integrate between 0 to any given time t. So not all the way to T sub s, but any given time t, you will get the charge Q sub n. And once you know the charge, you can get the voltage. How much voltage is, how will you get that? You will put this charge in, in NP, zero and T. So this is that charge. So you will just put this charge back in, N sub P is zero, that's the minority carrier, Ni squared divided by Na. So you know how much the diode is forward biased, and from that you can calculate how, what the forward bias voltage must have been. So again, you can calculate this and characterize this transition from the red triangle in the VA car to the green circle where it gradually turns off. So when you go home, make sure that maybe you can put it in a MATLAB or in your calculator, see how this works out. Put some value, forward bias current, you know, a milliamp maybe, a reverse bias current, maybe a microamp, put it in and see whether you can actually calculate these things. This is something I will not explain, but what I want to point out that if you worked a little harder, 
not too much hard, then you can also calculate this storage reversed uh, storage time, or this T sub R, and the T sub R has this complicated relationship, but you can see you know them all, right? You know IF, what was the forward bias current in the beginning? IR, well that was a final, final reverse bias current. T sub R is unknown. Tau sub P, what is that? That's the recombination time. You had more traps, the recombination will be more. Uh, you can put this whole thing in and you can see how you can calculate the T sub R. The error function, well, I'm sure you have forgotten, but you can look it up. And the point is that once you express it in a very simple form, you can calculate this. The point is that you can do it, so we'll not do it for the time being. And you can sum them up and look at the total current. And you can see that in most of the time, the T sub S, the T sub R is typically very small. You can see the dotted line and the solid line in general. And so therefore, the simple calculation we made is fine. For the time being, is fine. No need to understand it in detail, but if you really wanted to understand it, you can look at Z's book at page 117, uh, and then we, you can move on from there. But for the, for the time being, we'll not get into that, that detail. Turn on characteristics, again, that's very simple. Turn on characteristics, let's say you're initially you had a voltage and you now from a reverse bias, this time you just want to turn it on and go to the forward bias. And if you wanted to go in the forward bias, what do you do? Well, one thing you can say that at t equals infinity, whatever it is, at t equals infinity is going to be steady state again. So if it is steady state and you also know at t equals infinity, the current will get to the forward bias, whatever the steady state forward bias current is, I sub f. And uh, dq dt at t equals infinity is zero, right? Steady state, again, because you have transistor turned it on, steady state. And so therefore, at time t equals infinity, your current is IEF tau sub n. Right? That makes sense, because that will be the steady state current. And then again, the charge will exactly now go in the opposite direction. It will start with essentially zero. As soon as it's forward biased, although it doesn't have the full amount of charge, it will tilt the potential so that it can keep supplying the forward bias current. And you can see why the slope of the profile is essentially the same. dn dx at that point gives you the same forward bias current IF. And this will go on until it reaches steady state. And so, in the forward bias case, do you realize why this IEF must be the same? Because the out, output circuit wants the current to be the same, and therefore IEF is the same. And again, you can integrate it out. No rocket science here. This is the result of the integration. Because you started from time t equals zero, therefore it looks a little bit simpler. Does this final answer look about right? When t equals infinity, when t equals infinity, what will happen to the exponential, do you think? That will go away. So, of course, at q at t equals infinity, they must be equal to each other, right? And t equals infinity, I already know is i sub, I sub f multiplied by tau multiplied by tau, tau sub n, right? That's, I derived it in the last slide. And so, you can see that over time, in the beginning, when t equals zero, current uh, charge is zero t equals zero exponential gives you, exponential of zero gives you one, one minus one is zero. So in the beginning, you don't have any charge. Makes sense, right? And then when you have t equals infinity, forward bias current is gradually filling this tank up, you know, this storage tank up, and gradually you will have the full final potential. So you can calculate how the charge would behave as a function of time. Now, uh, on few other applications of how this charge control model uh, that you have just seen uh, used to do large signal transient, how it can be effectively used uh, to solve many other important problems. So one of them, which is very important, is calculating this diffusion time uh, by this charge control method. And what I mean by that is that assume that a device is forward biased, an electron has just been injected 
on the left hand side, let's say, uh, of the device, just at the edge of the minority carrier. And then this carrier will spend some time within this minority carrier region before eventually being collected by the right hand contact. The question is, how long does it take for the electron to go from the edge of this region to directly to the other contact? How long does it take? And that's the diffusion time because the electrons are moving by diffusion. Now, if this recombination was a dominant thing, then of course you expect, uh, uh, so you expect that the electrons would come and directly will recombine with the holes below. And that will be whatever is the response time, right? Because that is how long it takes for the electrons to go. But if you do not have traps, and as you can see, this triangular profile is saying that we do not have traps because the second derivative of diffusion equation is zero, ax plus b equals zero, uh, ax plus b equals the carrier concentration. So no traps. And in that case, what the electron does is, is sort of this, this issue that it takes an electron, takes many paths, and eventually gets out. And everybody takes a different path. Why does it go back and forth? Phonon scattering, ionized impurity scattering. So it scatters back and forth many times before it gets out. And the question is, how long does it take? Now, although the path looks complicated, a very simple formulation of the charge control can actually help us answer this question. So here, I do not have any recombination, so I will drop that term. Now, the way I can answer this question about how long it takes is effectively to assume that in the beginning I had a certain amount of charge and then I dropped the voltage, I turned the voltage off. And if I look how long does it take for this charge to decay away from this minority carrier region, away from this region altogether and restore equilibrium, that would be the amount of time the electron effectively on average, everybody has different time on average how long it takes for the electrons to get out. So you do something like this. You will say that right after zero plus, time t equals zero plus, when the voltage was turned off, I had a certain amount of charge. And at t equals infinity, well, the charge will be very small, right? Because that's the equilibrium charge. And the time for this charge effectively requires to drain it away, which is draining it away to the right-hand side, to the contact. Uh, that I will call the tau diffusion. So I can calculate the dqdt as a difference of initial and final charge divided by the time it takes for the charge to drain and the diffusion current. Now this I could drop because it's a small quantity and as a result I could write the tau diffusion is equal to this charge, initial charge I had divided by the current but you realize the charge is simply the area under this triangle half the ordinate multiplied by WP, WP is the base, so that's the total amount of charge Q in the beginning. And the current is simply uh, Q dn, dn dx, the derivative, but derivative is same everywhere here. It's a straight line, so that will simply be delta NP divided by WP. And the amazing thing is that it tells you that on the average, how long does it take for on the average, how long does it take for the electrons, the red electrons to bump around and get out of this region? And you can see it goes as WP squared. So the length of the minority carrier <coughs> squared divided by 2dn. Now why does it have this particular formulation? Uh, you can easily answer that question actually because you can see that I can write it approximately as WP, which is a distance, and DP, dn divided by WP is a diffusion velocity, right? And so, essentially, you have this WP squared divided by dn. That's what you have. And why there is a half? Well, half because some of the particles are sort of in the end, in the beginning, close to the right-hand side, some close to the left-hand side. And on the average, you have a transit time, which is sort of a mean of this time, because not everybody is starting on the left and going out, right, for this formulation. And so, that gives you a formulation of the diffusion time simply by using the charge control method. There are more complicated ways, but this is the simplest. Now, uh, you can also do another thing very conveniently with the charge control method, uh, which is to calculate the AC, uh, DC uh, diode current without having to go through solving all the minority carrier equation, you know, matching boundary condition. We did all those things in the uh, about two or three class ago. 
about, remember region 1, 2, 3, 4, all those complicated things. Uh, you don't have to do any of this. Charge control will almost give you an answer for that very quickly. For example, this way. So we are looking at steady state. So dq dt is 0. And I diffusion is the current that is coming in, which I don't know and want, want to calculate. But the, by the way, this tau sub n, if I don't have any recombination, I just told you that tau sub n is equal to tau diffusion because that is how it, it takes for the electrons to get out. Not through recombination, but by diffusion. So I, I put that in. And so I can write that the diffusion current, whatever that is, is equal to Q divided by tau diffusion. And if I put it in, then you will see the Q is again half the ordinate and multiplied by the WP, which is the base. But this time the Q is actually proportional to the voltage, exponentially proportional to the voltage. Remember that was the boundary condition that we did for as a function of voltage Fn minus Fp that gave me the quasi Fermi level separation and excess charge. So I can put that in, tau diffusion I just calculated and do you remember this equation, the final one, dn divided by Wp and I squared divided by Na and the exponential of the whole thing. That was the, that was the diode current, right? But I now did it just in two lines. And instead of having to go through all those complicated derivation, this is really easy, but of course you have to really understand the problem in depth before you can use this type of two-line derivation. That requires practice. And this is an exact expression that we actually got from the previous case. Okay, and very quickly then we talked about large signal response. This is of great importance in digital switching. Of course, I gave you a very simple example. But uh, in reality, uh, when you have a CMOS inverter, a MOSFET turning on and off, uh, the resistance and the output resistance capacitance, those are more complicated. So we'll have to reapply many of the things that we learned in actual situation. But for the time being, it gave you some idea. Uh, this way of solving differential equation by charge control, which is to get rid of the space derivative by integrating over a certain region, is a very powerful technique. It's a general mathematical technique, has got nothing to do with electrical engineering per se. Anytime you see a second order differential equation with time derivative built in, you can always use this and impress your professor that you can, you can do this. But this is a general way and it's really very, very powerful. And finally, the boundary conditions for these problems are uh, requests to be carefully done. T equals zero minus and how it couples to t equals zero plus. What happens to charge at infinity? Sometimes you will see charge goes away. So you can drop the infinity term. Sometimes the charge builds up to a steady state. Then you shouldn't drop the, uh, uh, the boundary condition, right? So this has to be, you, it has to be carefully done. And if it is done carefully, this simple uh, differential equation is very powerful. You can do a huge number of things uh, while using this, okay?